There's a moment in every human's life where everything changes for good or for bad. This was my moment. I hated everything about Mayfield High School. I hated their red and black school colors. I hated their cardinal bird mascot. I hated their cocky coaches, their arrogant fans, and their undeniable winning tradition. Mayfield was everything I wasn't. They won games by lopsided margins and they won championships so often victory was as expected as it was celebrated. Until 1993, there was almost nothing in the world I wanted more than to beat Mayfield. Just one time in my life, just let me beat Mayfield. The Wall Street Journal said he's one of the most innovative minds in football. He's a rat. ESPN once called him the guru of the spread. Scumbag. Football Scoop labeled him the mastermind behind college football's number one offense. Nobody likes him, not even his family. He took three separate teams over a five-year period and made each a top ten offense. Yeah, but he's such a horse's ass. He was fired by future United States Senator Tommy Tuberville in the middle of the season, even though he had a 5-2 and two record. No wonder CBS Sports said there's never been quite a coach like Franklin. He marches to a different beat. Pariah, an outcast, a person or animal that is despised, shunned. Or avoided. Warning. Buckle up and put your big boy pants on. This isn't your friendly kiss ass coaches show. If you can handle the truth, eject immediately. And now, from parts unknown, it's the pigskin pariah. The one, the only, Coach Tony Franklin. So my first thoughts of Mayfield High School and the Mayfield Cardinal was, somewhere in my life, I want to beat these guys. Because at Caldwell County High School, we never beat Mayfield. They beat us in football every time that we played them. So one of my goals of holding back and eventually becoming a good football player was to give myself the opportunity to help my high school football team to be able to beat the red and black Mayfield Cardinals. And it was something that if I did, I knew that it would be a major accomplishment that most young people in my school system never did. Well, guess what? I went through my entire career as a football player at Caldwell County High School, and I never beat Mayfield High School. Never had the opportunity to beat Mayfield, and we lost every season that we played them. I eventually go through college, decide to become a coach, And now I would get the opportunity as a football coach to beat Mayfield High School. So the first time I had that opportunity was my first year of coaching at Murray High School. Lost to Mayfield again, just like I did in high school. I then go and get my first real job to where I'm actually going to get paid. And now we're going to go play. I'm at Owensboro Catholic High School in Owensboro, Kentucky. And I got four defensive backs. I'm a defensive back coach. And I got four defensive backs that will knock your brains out. They will hit you in the mouth face to face, and I am absolutely proud to coach them because they are tough dudes. They will flat out get after you. And guess what? We're going to play Mayfield High School. And at Owensboro Catholic in those days, we didn't have a school bus. So many times we would drive to the game. And in this case, it was about a two and a half hour drive to Mayfield High School from Owensboro. And I was going to drive my defensive backs in a car to go down and play Mayfield and to play that great tradition. Well, Mayfield had a running back by the name of Marcus Moss. And Marcus Moss was probably the best running back in the state. He was incredibly fast and very elusive. And so I wanted to stop by my first coaching job at Murray High School and see my first few mentors, guys that I really admired, and I wanted to show off my defensive backs, and I wanted to tell them that we were going to go hit Mayfield in the mouth, and that Marcus Moss wouldn't know what hit him when we got done with him. So I stopped by, I introduced my players to these coaches, and I told them the story, and I said, we're going to hit this guy, we're going to hit him hard, and they just looked at me and they said, all right, Franklin, 
well, you stop back on your way back home and let us know how that goes. And they had a little smirk across their face. Well, it pissed me off. And I thought, you wait until you see these guys. Well, 50-something points later, Marcus Moss had scored about 100 touchdowns, and we didn't hit him one time. He was so much better than us. And I learned a huge lesson in football and in coaching. Everything is relative. My guys would hit you. They would hit you in the mouth. They would knock you to the ground if they could. The problem is they couldn't do it. This guy was elusive. He was fast. He had great moves. And there was no way in the world that we could do it. So what I did was I continued my career. A couple of years later, I was the head football coach at now Murray High School. I was the youngest head football coach in the state of Kentucky. And so I got to renew that rivalry with Mayfield High School. I got to coach against them three times in the same exact three results. They beat me every time, and I never was close to defeating them. So I was basically going to have a life of never defeating Mayfield. The closest I ever got to it, the very closest I ever got to beating Mayfield was my high school football coach, Al Giordano, who was like a second father to me. In his final game as a career high school football coach, he had never defeated Mayfield. We had lost to him every time since Coach G was the head coach. And going into his final game, he had one of the worst teams that he had in the history of our school. He'd only won two games. Mayfield would go on to be the state champs, just like they did on many occasions. The head football coach there was a guy named Jack Morris. He was named Coach of the Decade for the 1970s, and he was named Coach of the Decade of the 1980s. There's no way in the world that Coach Giadana is going to have that final win against a team he would consider his biggest rival, whereas Mayfield would look at Caldwell as not even being a rival because you've got to beat them every now and then if they're going to be your biggest rivalry. So in that game, all day long, it poured down. I mean, it poured down rain like you could not imagine. The field ended up being completely soaked in mud. You could barely walk let alone run. So all of a sudden, this gigantic advantage of speed that Mayfield normally had when they played Caldwell was gone. The football gods had smiled upon my high school coach. My high school coach had a chance. And sure enough, they go out and they win the game. And when the game is over with, Coach Giordana took off his Caldwell County shirt and he walked across the field to shake hands with the legendary coach, Jack Morris, a man that he respected, but he also despised because he knew he could never beat him. And on the T-shirt that Coach Giordano now was wearing across the field, he had Caldwell County defeats Mayfield. Coach Giordano knew something that I didn't know. Sometimes the football gods will smile upon you, And Coach Giordano was one of the best human beings that I ever knew. And he was the person that I wanted to be like when I became a coach. Willing to fight for my players against all odds. Willing to stand up for them no matter what it took if I believed that the players were right. So I felt a small part of that victory. But in reality, I had never defeated Mayfield. I would go to my grave never being able to defeat Mayfield. And so I had this hatred of Mayfield. And as my life moved on, I went from being this young single bachelor at Murray High School and getting back into coaching after taking the first year, being an entrepreneur and having some success, meeting my wife, Laura, beginning a family, having three children, and then all of a sudden feeling the pressure that I needed to get back into coaching and to get a real job. And so I did that. I started back at Davis County High School as a football coach. I then went to Callaway County High School. And then I had this other attempt as an entrepreneur to where I went in and I decided to go make a million dollars and I got my ass kicked and I failed. And the next thing that happens to us is that miserable feeling in life when you're a father, you have children, and you don't have a job. You don't have insurance because you failed as an entrepreneur for the second time in your life. And the next thing you know, you have to go live with the in-laws. You're lucky 
you're fortunate that you have in-laws that will take you in, but it's one of the most degrading feelings that you have is that when you got to go in, live in the basement, and then try to figure out how to go back and make a living again. I was convinced to myself that I could make it some way or another as an entrepreneur. I kept trying everything I could. Then one day, I just finally end up doing anything I can to put food on the table. And I am actually selling little throw rugs that you could throw down and cover about a two feet wide by four feet long space that were made up of your favorite college basketball team or your favorite college football team to look like their stadium or to look like their arena. Well, I'm desperate. I'm putting 40 or 50 of these. I've cut out a deal with a store that's selling them. I'm just going into the store and the rug sells for me. My cost on it is $20 and I'm selling it for $40. Well, I'm living in the in-laws and I am trying to figure out a way to make a living. I'm trying to figure out a way to make just a little bit of money some way or another. I got to figure out a way to do my part and to pay my bills. Laura's working in a daycare. Her parents are helping us and I am miserable. So I will take off and I'll be gone on the road. I'm in the state of Alabama going door to door selling Alabama National Championship rugs. I'm sleeping in my car because I don't have enough money for a hotel. It is the misery of misery. Eventually, I go to Dallas, Texas, and I go to the state of Texas, and I'm selling Dallas Cowboy rugs door to door. And again, I'm making just enough money every now and then to be able to get one night of sleep in a Motel 6 or to pay for a shower at a truck stop. Laura's making money working at a daycare. The parents are helping us out to get by. I'm on what I call family welfare. Not government welfare, but family welfare. I'd be on government welfare if I didn't have family welfare. And in the meantime, I decide that I've sold all the Dallas Cowboy rugs I can sell. I make a trip home. It's somewhere around May or June. I can't remember the exact date. I walk in. I see my wife. We embrace. We have a conversation. And she delivers some bad news to me. She tells me that she's got the beginning of precancerous cells. I drop to my knees and I bawl and I grab her and I'm sobbing and I'm crying. And the thought comes over me, I have no insurance. My wife is going to have to have surgery. I've got three small children. I am the shittiest human parent that you can imagine. I am a pathetic excuse for an adult and I need to get a real job. And so we begin the process of Laura going and having surgery. I borrow money from my father in order to help pay for the hospital bills to get into this. I end up having to take a large sizable loan from my dad, which takes me years to pay back. But again, I'm lucky. I've got family welfare, and I understand that. But I also understand that I probably need to suck my gut in, suck my pride up, and get a real job. In the meantime, I beg, borrow, and steal from anybody that'll give me 100 bucks, 20 bucks, friends anywhere here or there. And when I get enough money, I do the dumbest thing you can do, which is I go to the horse race track at Paducah Downs, and I plan on making 100 grand. Somewhere or another, I'm going to be that one lucky soul that's going to make money at the track, and I'm going to get out of this debt, and I'm going to show everybody that I can do it. So I'm at the track sometime in the summertime of 1993. What a pathetic human being I am. I'm sitting there, and I lose 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks. I'm down to my last $20, and I'm studying that racing form as if my life depends upon it, and I look and I find a horse that I think is going to steal the race. He's going to get out in front and he's going to win the race. And I find another horse that I believe is going to get out with him and stay just off of him and get second. I look at the payoff on a $20 bet and it's going to be $1,239. And I thought, holy crap, if I can make $1,239, I can pay the bills for another 30 days. I can help my in-laws. I can do this. This is the greatest thing in life. And I'm just thinking to myself again, how pathetic are you? You're going to go home if you lose this. 
you're going to have to pay somebody back that you just borrowed a hundred bucks from. You're going to write another code check and hope that over the weekend you can make enough money before that code check bounces or else have to go to your brother or your aunt or your uncle or your good friend and ask for another hundred bucks or 200 bucks somewhere along the way. Again, what a pathetic human being you are. I don't know if I can spend one more night with my hands grasping my face, bent over between my knees, and thinking how horrible of a human being I am. Well, the race takes off, and my one horse goes out to the lead just like I thought it would. And the two horses set right off his ass. And they go into the race, and the one is going to win by seven or eight lengths. Now all I got to do is have that two horse come in. If he just comes in second, at least I'm going to have some rest for at least for a night or two. The code check is not going to bounce. I'm going to be able to cover that. I'm going to be able to pay back a hundred bucks to a buddy of mine that loans it out to me. And here they come down the stretch and I'm yelling as if my life depends upon it. And they get to the wire and my two horse barely wins. He barely finishes second. And I cash that check and my heart is beating 100 miles an hour, and I think I might have a heart attack. I'm walking out the door, and I'm feeling a little bit better about life, and guess who I bump into? The greatest coach in the state of Kentucky, Jack Morris, the head coach at Mayfield. I hate Jack Morris, not because of the human characteristics of him or the family characteristics or because of how he's ever treated me when he's seen me. I hated him because he beat my ass. I hated him because he was what I needed to be. He won. He knew how to win. And he wasn't over at the racetrack trying to pay his bills. He was at the racetrack because he loved horses. He actually owned some trotters. And he loved the game. And he sees me and he looks at me and he goes, Hey, Tony, how you doing? I said, Coach, I'll be honest with you. I'm not doing very well. I'm struggling. I can't get a job. I fucked up. I got these three girls at home. I'm a pathetic parent. I'm not doing a very good job as a human being. And he looked at me and he said, I tell you what, Tony, you want a job? I said, yes, sir. And Jack had just retired. So he was no longer the head coach. He had just retired. And he looked at me and he he wrote down a phone number and he said, this is coach Paul Leahy, the new head coach. They took my place, and I knew who Coach Leahy was. He was Coach's loyal assistant for so many years at Mayfield. He was the best defensive coach in the state. Everybody knew about Coach Leahy. And he said, give me time to talk to him and give him a call. He goes, we got a middle school coach opening and a teaching job over there. And he said, call Coach Leahy, and he'll hire you and give you a job, and you'll be able to pay your bills and get your family back. And I said, Coach, Thank you so much. I I can't tell you how much this means to me and whether I get the job or not. And he said, hey, you're going to get the job. Don't worry about that. You'll get the job. So I'm thinking to myself, how the hell does he know? I got to go through job interviews and all that stuff to get it. But he knows a whole lot more than I do at that time. As I walk away and I head towards my car, I think to myself, I hate Jack Morris. I hate Mayfield. I don't want to go work for Mayfield. That's going to work for the enemy. I want to beat Mayfield. Why would Jack Morris help me get a job? Maybe he's not this evil man that defeats everybody and beats them by 30 and 40 points. Maybe he's got a good heart. Maybe he's got a good soul. Or maybe he just feels sorry for me. But more than likely, he looked and he saw how hurt I was. And he saw that I was a damaged person, a damaged soul. And he gave me a chance. So I go home. I tell Laura. She's excited as hell that her pathetic husband might actually go get a job. And so I wait like he told me. I call Coach Leahy. Coach Leahy said, come on over, Tony. He's this big Irish redheaded man. I wish I could imitate his voice, but I can't. And he was this boisterous, loud soul. I get in my car and I drive over and they've got everything set up. 
I see Coach Leahy, he says, go see the middle school principal. He's going to give you the job. You'll have to see the superintendent, but it's already a done deal. Everybody knows who you are. And he goes, you'll coach with our seventh grade. I wasn't going to be the head coach. Now think about this. At age 25, I had been the youngest head coach in the state of Kentucky. I'd been an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator. I had been somebody. Now, I was going to go be an assistant seventh grade coach, an assistant eighth grade coach. I was going to scout on Friday nights for the varsity, and I would help in the summer with the varsity, and whenever they needed me to help do anything, whether it was paint lines, carry water on and off the field, that's what I was going to be. But the main thing was I was going to get to teach seventh and eighth grade, and I was going to get a real paycheck, and I was going to make about 20 something or or 30 something thousand dollars a year. And I was gonna be able to have health insurance and take care of my children and put them in a decent home and get out of living in the basement of our in-laws and not have all the people take care of me. So this was a huge deal for me. And I was extremely grateful. So I go through the routine of seeing the middle school principal, seeing the school superintendent, and then getting hired and having a good job. Laura was excited. We moved to Mayfield. We pack up the kids. We moved to Mayfield. We find this cool little house on a corner. That was the kids were going to have their own bedrooms. They were going to have a neighborhood with other kids to play in. And I was going to have a real job. And I was actually going to get starting paid early because at Mayfield, as a teacher and as a coach, you got an extended month to coach football and get paid as a teacher. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that I was now going to be making 30 something thousand dollars a year, the most money I'd ever made as a teacher and a coach, and I was going to be able to have insurance. Laura was actually going to be able to start a daycare in her house and take care of some of the coach's kids and some of the other people around town. We were actually going to be able to survive with the exception of one thing. I had a lot of money to pay back. So I was constantly going to continue to get odd jobs. I was going to sell anything I could find to sell. I was going to sell satellites out of my house. I did encyclopedias at night. I can never forget going to this home in the nine o'clock at night, pitch dark to a trailer and selling a family, a set of encyclopedias for about $1,200 for my commission was about $250 and me feeling guilty as I left the home because I thought these people need everything under the sun more than they need encyclopedias. But I needed the $250 so that I could help give my kids a decent Christmas. I still continued to do those side jobs to try to help make more money and to pay back the money that I owed, to pay my father back and to try to be a better parent. But in the meantime, something in my life happened. Hey, don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this short 30 second message. You're listening to the Coach Tony Franklin Podcast on the Coach TF Network. Whether you're a fan, coach, or player, visit CoachTF.com and improve your football life. And make sure to give us a five-star review immediately after this episode so we can continue to bring you this information for free. I got real amazing coaching camaraderie. I remember that summer to where all of a sudden I could feel something that was unique and different. There was no playbook. We didn't have coaches meetings to decide what we were going to do out on the field. There was basically, for me, no preparation as I was going out on the field for the first day of varsity practice before the seventh and eighth grade began. It was really simple. These guys knew what they were going to do, and I better just figure it out, figure out what I was going to do to help. We were walking out on the field and thinking to myself, how in God's name do these people win? There's no organization. There's no meeting. There's no planning. Well, you know what I found out? When everybody knows what they're doing and everybody has this tradition and they believe in themselves and they've got good players and they've got this 
thing inside of them that everybody knows what it takes to win. Good, hard toughness, amazing camaraderie, simple offensive and defensive schemes. Everybody's on the same page. When I say everybody, I mean parents, teachers, fans, everybody knows what's expected. At Mayfield, we're expected to win, and we're expected to win every game. And if we don't win every game, there's disappointment. The kids understand that. That's their tradition. That's a heavy burden to carry, but the whole community understands it. So I go out and I get to be a part of something special. But the really part of something special that I got to be a part of was just being on a coaching staff to where that everybody was on equal footing. Everybody liked each other and everybody hated each other. But there was no hidden agendas. Everybody knew what the common goal was. And that was you better win football games at Mayfield High School. You better win football games at Mayfield freshman team. You better win football games if you're the seventh grade coach, if you're the eighth grade coach. Nothing less than that was expected. The players knew it and everybody else knew it. And I all of a sudden started to feel like I could possibly be a winner. And the other thing that was cool was that everybody made fun of each other and they did it out loud. Everybody usually got some type of a nickname. And I early on found out that my cancer from years ago, that everybody would walk around with eggshells from this gigantic crater hole in my head, about an inch wide and two, and a half, two inches long, at Mayfield, that was free game. My nickname on the first day was, hey, Coach Hole in the Head, hand me this. And I looked and I thought to myself, did they just say what I thought he said? David Morris, assistant coach, just called me Coach Hole in the Head? He sure did. And I laughed so hard I almost cried. It was camaraderie. We won games together. We won state championships together. Two out of three years that I'm at Mayfield, we win state championships. And the year that we didn't, we went to the semifinals and we got beat. And when we did, not one person in the community said, hey, you guys did a good job. Y'all will get them next year. Hell no. Everybody in that community said the same thing. What the fuck's wrong with y'all? You know, you're supposed to win championships and you didn't do it. And the players knew it. And they knew the next year that the expectations were higher. So for me, this was something unique and different. And I loved it. When games were over with, all the families got together from all the sports, whether you were the tennis coach, the basketball coach, it didn't make any difference. Everybody was a part. The women's basketball coach, the men's basketball coaches, they all scouted. They went and watched other teams play, just like I did, and took notes and came back and gave scouting reports to help you to be better prepared to give a chance to win. We all drank together. We gambled together. Our wives got along. Everybody was in. And if you weren't all in, you didn't survive. You didn't last. If you were an individual, if you were a pretty boy, if you were independent, there was no place for you at Mayfield High School. So for the first time in my life, I learned about winning. And man, oh man, as time went by, some of the coaches that I've worked with over the years in college, boy, could they learn some lessons from Mayfield. A couple of those things that I learned that were just absolutely mind-blowing. First of all, coaches' speeches didn't mean shit. Coach Leahy would have the most incredible pregame speech that took somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 seconds. And it would basically come down to this. You're Mayfield, you will hit people in the mouth, and you will go out and we will kick their ass. End of story, that was it. But the greatest pregame speech I ever heard to this day in my life was one of the games in my first year where I did not have to go and scout. And so I was on the bus riding with the players from the basketball facility where we got dressed from Mayfield High School. It was about a five-minute bus ride to 10-minute bus ride to the stadium where we played the games. 
And so I was on the bus, and like many buses that I rode, and on the pregame bus ride over, players don't usually say a whole lot, if anything. On this bus ride over, everyone was dead quiet. And all of a sudden, we pulled over the top of the hill, and I heard something go, Mayfield. And then I heard the beat of the bleachers, and the beat of the bleacher seats were... And there was these beating, this thumping, the thumping on these bleacher seats. And then there was the chant, Mayfield, Mayfield. And the closer we got, they kept beating. They were beating their seats, beating their seats, beating their seats, beating their seats. And the chant, Mayfield, 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 Mayfield. And by the time that bus stopped, let me tell you something. It had been a lot of years since I'd played a game. And I was probably a little overweight in those days, not a lot. But I believe one thing, I had a couple of good plays left in me when I got off that bus. Mikey Bright, who would end up being the best overall football player that I ever saw in my life. He was a starting linebacker. He could play defensive back, could play corner. He could play receiver. He could play running back. He played wherever we needed him to play. And in 1993, Mikey Bright could wheel a team to a state championship because Mikey Bright knew the tradition of Mayfield and he hated to lose. And Mikey Bright taught me on that bus ride that all you need with tradition is to have young people to understand what it is, to have a coaching staff that understands it's not about them. It's about installing what was there 10 years before, what was there 20 years before, what was there 30 years before. And those players knew. And no one said a word except Mikey Bright. And by the time we got off that bus, whenever we got off that bus, whoever it is that Mayfield was going to play, they believed they could beat the Green Bay Packers. And trust me, if you came to Mayfield High School, you better be the Green Bay Packers because you weren't going to beat Mayfield at Mayfield High School. It just didn't happen very often. But believe it or not, the first year that I'm there in the first game against our crosstown rival, who had only started football a few years before, They had a great coach and a great program builder by the name of Jay Buckley. And Jay had one of the best teams in the state of Kentucky, and nobody knew it at the time. They knew he had a pretty good team. And the opening game for Coach Paul Leahy was going to be against the crosstown rival, Graves County. And Coach Leahy, we go out and we play. And you can imagine, you're taking the place of the coach of the decade of the 70s, the coach of the decade of the 80s, Jack Morris, who had helped me to get hired there. And on your very first game against that team, the Crosstown rival, you can't lose because if you lose, they're probably going to run you out of town. Guess what? We lost. We lost. The fans were enthralled. There was probably a moving sign out in front of Coach Leahy's house the next day. But you know what he did? He didn't panic. He relied upon tradition. He relied upon a belief in himself. We weren't very good on offense, and we weren't good that entire season on offense. Lesson number two, you can win a championship with a great defense and an average to below average offense. You can't win a championship with a great offense and a horrible defense. It ain't going to happen. Never has, never will. Defense wins championships. It always has, it always will. Coach Leahy knew that. We got better on offense, but the main thing we got better at on offense was don't turn the ball over, don't lose the game, let the defense do their thing, and we'll figure out a way to get the ball in the end zone somewhere along the way. Coach Leahy brought that team back. We win 12 games. We win in the state championship game, in a hard-fought game, in a pouring-down rainstorm. We score a touchdown late. When the game is over with, it's one of the neatest things that – I've experienced when when football teams win, the coach likes to gather everybody up and give a speech and talk about this, praise people, say whatever it is that he's going to do. I even worked for one coach whose deal was to make fun of the other team when the game was over with, which I thought was one of the most 
embarrassing things as a football coach is that after every game he would gather the team up and then make fun of the opponent that we had just defeated, whereas most football coaches that I've worked with usually have respect for their opponents, especially after a game is over with. But Coach Leahy taught me early on that the best thing to do when a ball game is over with is to do what Mayfield High School does. He said nothing. We won a state championship. Everybody's celebrating, crying, hugging, all that stuff on the field. The game is over with. Everybody's done all their celebrating out on the field. And Coach Leahy's philosophy was, what is there to say? So we went in, took a shower, got on a bus, and drove home. The same as we would have if we had just beaten a team that we beat 50 to nothing. There was no difference because what was expected is that when you're a championship program, this is what is expected of you. Yes, you're happy. Yes, there's celebration. But Coach Leahy's philosophy was, what do I need to say something? Everything has already been done on the field. And the last thing in the world I want to do is take away from that feeling and to take away from what just happened. And so what happened to me that was incredibly special to me was that I had coached seventh grade that year and was an assistant coach and got to call plays on the seventh grade team and on the eighth grade team. Well, for the first time in my life, almost all the plays that I called, they actually worked. We had good players. And so we would win every game, and we would usually win them with a pretty big score. And I learned football. We were a wishbone team that lined up. We didn't run triple option. We ran power football and play action passes. And I learned a new style of football that I never knew before. But basically, when that season was over with, I took what I learned as a seventh grade coach, an eighth grade coach, helping with the varsity when I could. But at the state championship game, I was actually at the game because there was no one left to scout. The week before, I was scouting, and now there was nobody left to scout. And so I was at the game on the field, and as the game went on and the game was close in the fourth quarter, for me, that's what I thrive at, and it's what I love. And although I hadn't been on the sideline throughout the season, I didn't hold back. I was loud, I gave advice, and I tried to assist, and I tried to help. So at the banquet, When the season is over, all the coaches at Mayfield got a really nice reward when you win the state championship. You think about this, 1993, to get $1,000 is like getting $10,000 today. And I've been at colleges and won championships where you didn't get a $10,000 bonus for winning a championship. But at Mayfield High School, we all got $1,000. Well, that's a huge deal to be rewarded. It didn't matter if you were the seventh grade coach or if you were the ninth grade coach, or if you were the defensive coordinator on the varsity, you still got that reward. And that makes everything better. Everybody feels a piece of it, and everybody feels a part of it. But I got a really unexpected thing to happen. During the banquet, when Coach Leahy is going through and talking and and naming different things and saying appreciation, etc., the most stunned human being there is me. Because he singles me out, and he makes a statement. And he says, we wouldn't have won this without Tony's help. Tony did a lot of great things for us this season on the state championship game. He came through with some really good suggestions and some ideas. Well, for the first time in my life as an assistant coach, and then eventually as a college coach for many, many years, very seldom, I could count on less than five times in my life to where that a head college coach said something positive about me at any time. And for a school like Mayfield, with the tradition that they had, with never beating them, never able to defeat them, to have that man to say those words to me made me believe that maybe for the first time in my life, in my career, that maybe I was a good coach. Maybe I could be something good in this profession. It gave me confidence. So as the next two seasons go on, my role increases. I called plays for a season on the varsity. And like I said, we won state championships two of the three years. But the most important thing that happened to me at Mayfield High School had nothing to do with football. And that was is that as I was rebuilding and rebuilding a life and having medical insurance 
and our children being happy. Our three girls would fight you over Mayfield. They all remember the time there as being special. They remember one of our daughters even still has a Mayfield t-shirt that she wears. And they all remember the camaraderie. They remember how everyone was together for a common cause. They all remember that special love and that special feeling. And that's why Mayfield won. They didn't win because of redshirting. They won because they had good players, they had good coaches, but a lot of people have good players and good coaches. We beat teams that had better players than us. We beat teams that would have multiple players signed Division I, and it was very occasional that Mayfield would have a Division I football player that would sign somewhere and be able to go play. But what we were able to do there was because of everybody being all in, nobody caring who got the glory, nobody caring who got all the rewards, everybody feeling good about what to happen. And my daughters remember that. My wife remembers that. We remember that. And we know that all the places that we left and went after that all fell short of that camaraderie. They all fell short of that complete winning attitude. But after that season, and I go back out to selling encyclopedias, selling satellites, and selling yellow pages. I had a job where I sold fishermen yellow pages. I did everything I could because I had a lot of money I owed. Because the one thing I did was that when my parents Bart loaned me money or my in-laws or my brother or my aunts, my uncles, my friends, is that I paid those people back. I worked hard to be able to do that with the friends that I had in life that tried to help me. And all these coaches knew that I was out there while they were playing golf in the summer and they were having a good time in the summer. I was working my ass off. And so seven men, and I won't give their identities because they haven't given me permission to do that, but seven men came to me and they were comprised in that town. They were everything from people I coached with to people that were businessmen in the communities to people that I knew incredibly well people that my wife helped take care of their children. But the bottom line was seven people came to me without me asking. They looked at me, two of them were the representatives, and they said, Tony, we're tired of seeing you having to work the way you do. You're a good guy. You've done good things for us here. We want to help you. How much money does it take for you to get off this incredible debt that you've got in your life and for you to relax a little bit and to enjoy life a little bit more, and to play some more golf with us and drink a little bit more beer with us, go to the racetrack a little bit more with us. And I told them, I said $38,000, because that was all the bills that I owed, all the different money to put together to pay back all these different people. And then obviously, to be able to do that over about a 10-year period would take away these gigantic monthly payments I was making and be able to cut it down and to make it a lot less payment to where I could breathe. They didn't blink an eye. Seven men went together to a bank. And as they say that, I still get tears in my eyes to this day because they didn't have to do that. And seven men went together with their wives allowing them and being a part of it and more than likely having to put their signatures on it as well. And they gave me this money. They loaned it to me. And they signed off with a bank to where I co-signed on the loan. And they let me breathe. And I breathed again. And I believed in humanity. And I believed in people. And I believed in the game of football. I worked for a coach once that said there was nothing worse in the world than losing a football game. That coach was completely full of shit. And he was wrong. He never understood what football really means. Football was not about winning. At Mayfield, we won championships. And we beat everybody's ass most of the time. That wasn't why we won. We won because there was this genuine love and caring for each other. And yes, football was a common bond. Toughness was something that we didn't talk about at Mayfield. You just fucking were tough. Most of the guys that I know that talk about that all the time are weak. And they talk about it because they weren't. And they try to draw that out in themselves. 
but at Mayfield, Kentucky, Mikey Bright was one tough man. Chad Haley was one tough man. John Slosher was one tough man. Terrell Starks was one tough man. We had tough men playing football. We had tough family members that had tradition. But I had a bunch of guys that looked at a father of three daughters and they saw pain and they saw somebody fighting and then they saw somebody come in that helped them to get what they wanted. And they came to me without me asking and they said, let us help you. Let us relieve your pain. Let us help you to have a good life. Let us help you to help your daughters. And so a year later, or two years later, after these guys do this, I take a head football coaching job and I get a $12,000 pay raise. And the only reason I got that job was because of Mayfield. One year later, I am the running back coach at the University of Kentucky. The head football coach that got hired there, I helped him to get hired. That's a whole other story for another podcast. But I do know this, that in the end, he's able to hire me as the running back coach at the University of Kentucky in the Southeastern Conference, not because of me as a head coach at Mercer or Callaway or Murray High or an assistant at Owensboro Catholic or Davis County or Callaway. He was able to hire me because of Mayfield. Because at Mayfield, I learned to win. At Mayfield, people thought that maybe I was a good coach. At Mayfield, I learned to be a better father, to have more responsibility, to have insurance, and to be a better human being. Mayfield, Kentucky, the Mayfield Cardinals saved me. They saved my life. They made me feel like I was somebody. And they made me feel like that one day, maybe I could achieve my dreams as a football coach because I learned how to win. I learned what it took. I learned that you don't mock your opponents when you beat them, that you respect them. I learned that there's so many more things that go into winning. It's not about ego. It's about caring for each other and caring for their families and not talking, but actually doing it. I love the red and black colors of Mayfield. I love the Cardinal bird. I love the cocky, arrogant coaches and the fans of Mayfield, Kentucky. I am a Mayfield Cardinal forever. Thanks for listening to today's show. One, go to coachtf.com slash podcast and leave us your email so we can send you your free download for our pigskin pocket card, which gives you 10 simple steps to follow daily to ensure an amazing life. Two, Do something good today for someone who can never repay you, and you'll have truly lived an amazing life. Three, join us Monday through Friday for new episodes and download any of our episodes wherever you get your podcast or simply download from our coachtf.com slash podcast. Four, give us a five-star review today so we can continue to put together entertaining and informative episodes. Always remember, do good. No repay.